my circumstance does not change God. Amen. The view of my circumstance certainly changes me and changes my usefulness for God. But I'm so thankful that my understanding or my walking through a valley or a mountain is not the thing that, that, that changes God. If that was the case, God would be as erratic as we are. <laughs> you know, he'd be as, as unfounded and untruthful and as unstrengthened by anything as we are. You know, so I'm thankful that that He's God on the mountain and in the valley. <clears throat> so when we look at the examples that we kind of walked through, we we went through uh, divorce last week and Jesus' teaching and, and, and what He taught on that. And then we move forward, and he's, he's, he's starting to communicate. Um, and, he, and he's, you know, this rich young ruler, and the, or the rich in the kingdom of God is how it's kind of outlined in, in, in Mark. And it's Mark 10, you know, verse, around verse 17. This view, this approach, you know, we've talked about the rich young ruler. Now, in Mark's account, he's not labeled as the rich young ruler, so I'm just making sure we make the connection that, and Matthew and, and Luke, where there's this nobleman and there's a ruler, and the, that this is all the same account. This is all the same story. And as we know, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the synoptic gospels. They are three tellings of the same story, four tellings of the same story from four different perspectives. So this is the account that Mark gives of the rich young ruler. Now we've approached this, and you've probably heard many messages on it. And I've even I've even preached on that, you know, here uh, on the rich young ruler and, and, and the approach that he has to Jesus and, and what that looks like. And we kind of made the connection when, when the last time that I spoke on this scripture of um, you know how the rich young ruler started out, and then we get to the end of it, and it says that that with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. And then we chronologically look, though Mark's account doesn't give us that. Um, Luke's account does, where he moved right on, and then he's he's ministering to Lazarus, you know, and then Zacchaeus in the tree, and we see with the example of Zacchaeus, you know, what happens is this must of ministry, as as the the title of the sermon was, that 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 Jesus must meet with him, and in that we looked at the account that he was just as wealthy by all stretches of the imagination of the, as this rich young ruler. But within that, he had given up everything that he owned without even having to be told to give up everything that he owned because he came in the presence of Jesus. Do we remember that story? Do we remember that? Well, we want to go in and look at um, from a different perspective today. Not changing the truth of the Scripture because the truth of the Scripture is the truth of the Scripture. But there's a perspective that comes in here as we take the chronological walk through Mark that comes in and it says, you know, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. You know, we've seen some of these examples as we've fleshed through the scripture. We've seen a demon-possessed man charge at Jesus. We've seen crowds kind of pushing in on Jesus. We've seen a lot of different examples of this type of a thing. But what we see in his motivation... In, in this rich young ruler, because we gain other information from other accounts in the different Gospels, that this guy was a very successful guy. He was the, the I see it, I can achieve it, and I'm going to go after it. If I want it, I can have it. He was very empowered, self-empowered. Amen? He was a guy who had achieved much success from seeing something that he wanted and going after it. Isn't that our culture today? Isn't that what every self-help book will tell you? If, you? if you want something, that desire can be fulfilled by you, and you can achieve anything if you will just go after it. You can have anything. Well, I, I think that in this scenario, that that's kind of what was motivating this rich young ruler. The rich young ruler was seeing something that he wanted, and he was going after it. And, and, and based upon all of his other success and how he had accomplished and what he had done and everything else, all his history told him that if he would just go after it, then he could have it. Amen? And that's why we see him running. 
He had heard about this Jesus. He had heard about the miraculous things. And, and that Jesus and all those, that joy and that peace and the healing and the power, he had heard about all those things. He's like, you know what? I've got wealth. I've got temple. I've got, I've got land. I've got all that. I don't have that. I don't have that kind of power. I want that. So he rushed down to the seminar. Amen. Got first in line to get the ticket. And dropped at the seminar leader's feet. And said, good teacher, how can I get what you got? Because I don't have it. His motivation to get there, his motivation was self. What could he accomplish? What could I get? Because I can have anything that I put my mind to. I can be anything as long as I work hard enough. <clears throat> So this has to be true of whatever it is that this good teacher has. Matter of fact, he ought to, you know, when, when I go running, I'm sure, I'm sure what happened is he waited until Jesus saw where he was running from. Okay, why? Because as Jesus is walking down the road, he looks over and then there's this big palace type of a thing. Right? That's where I come from. See what I've accomplished? Look at everything that I have, but I'm coming to fall at your feet because I want to know how I can have the stuff that you have. I've already got all this stuff. How can I get what you've got? Look what I bring to the table. How about giving me some of what you got? Or matter of fact, if you just want a little bit of what I got, done. I've got plenty. <coughs> Loved ones, the approach of my mother must. The approach of most American Christians is bringing to the table what I got. And thinking that, that somehow God's like, I'm sure glad you brought that. I don't know how we would have done it without it. <laughs> and that's just not the truth. That's just not the truth. So his approach was saying to, to him, and what Jesus used was... was you know, how, how awesome Jesus is. Of course, we all agree with that or we wouldn't be here. But how he used, he kind of flipped what the guy said. Because the guy was flippantly using a word that shouldn't be attributed. You know, that in their culture, that, that good, that, 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 that good word, he was, he was using good teacher. You know, he was throwing around a, a, a word flippantly that should have some reverence. Because they knew in their culture... That the only thing good was God. They had studied that. This rich ruler had certainly studied that. So he was almost trying to encourage Jesus. Fluff him up. By giving him an account. By giving him a recognition. By giving him a name. Good teacher. And what Jesus says is, in fact, why do you call me good? We know that the only thing good comes from God. The only one good is God. What he's saying is, do you recognize me for who I truly am? Because that's the flip. You know, if we say to somebody, well, why do you call me good? <laughs> why do you put me up on a pedestal? Because, because God's the only one who deserves to be there. I feel that a lot. They don't deserve to be there. Won't be there. Only God deserves to be there. You see, the difference, though, the difference was when Jesus said it, is that He is, in fact, God. So what He's trying to help the guy say is, is, is your lack of understanding of who I truly am, though you're calling me, you're using it flippantly. Because you're trying to flatter me into a relationship. You would love nothing more for me to say, get up, bro, come on, come on, let's look at what you got. Let's go look at all the things you got. Tell, tell me about how did you get this collection? And where did you find that piece of art? And how did you come across all of this that you have? Tell me your story. And he would have been, oh, let me tell you all about a good teacher. And they could have, as he probably had with a lot of rabbis. Amen? 
as he had with a lot of the religious people of that day. Sat down and had some wine and enjoyed it out of big nice goblets and had a great dinner and kind of thumbed their nose at the culture around them that hadn't quite arrived to the place that they had arrived. Jesus, good teacher, come hang out with me for a little while. Let me glean. Let me glean. Let me glean from you, but, but, but more so, let me tell you about my story. Anybody? Anybody, when it's about your testimony, when it's about what's going on in your life, and, and, and you're going to share, whether it be with God, <laughs> sillily, we think we share that with God as if He didn't know it. But when we share with our culture, isn't it, isn't it too often about our story and not His story? Isn't it too often that, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that the hypocrisy comes from us pointing at ourselves? And not pointing to Jesus. You know, if we point to Jesus in the true term of, of hypocrisy, when we look at that, we say that, that hypocrisy is telling someone to do something that you're incapable of doing. Would we agree? That that's hypocrisy. The reality is, is every Christian should be a hypocrite, but it should be negative. Because they should be pointing to Jesus. And saying, we're trying to get there too. The problem is it's hypocrisy because I point to me. Because I say where I've come from and what I'm doing and how I found Jesus. That's when it becomes hypocrisy because a person can look at your life and say, you don't have it. You're still this, you're still that. The church is still this, the church is still that. So if the church is pointing at the church, it's hypocrisy. If the church is pointing to Jesus on their pilgrimage to Jesus and says, guess what? Come along. Come with us. Come walk with us. We'll walk slower at times if we need to walk slower. We're going to pick up the pace at times when we need to pick up the pace. But we're going to walk with you because we're all on a pilgrimage to a place that we could not accomplish without Jesus. Amen. Too often it's, look what I bring to the table. What can you do without Jesus? And he says, Absolutely nothing. And we say, what? But I've accomplished all of this. But I have all of this. And he says what? Give it all away. And follow me. Because he called the guy on what his true heart motive was. He called the rich young ruler. You see, we go in and he says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. What did Jesus call him on? All the things that he had already built his faith on. Amen? These were all the reasons that he felt like he had achieved. If you don't believe it, read the next thing. He says, I've already done all that. I've done this since birth. And Jesus says, I know. I know you think that's the way. I know you think that that's how it happens. I know that you believe. And guess what? In that same belief, you think somehow you have the power to judge me and call me good. Because if you have the power to call me good, then guess what else you have the power to do? To call me bad. You don't have the power to do either. Not what you were created to do. Either. You see, there's a pretty side to judgment too. Or we call it pretty, but it's just as ugly. It's just as ugly. If we're not working tandemly in this ministry, if we're not trying to move forward to, to reach people for the Lord, and that's not our chief motivation, if it's we find someone good over here or better, who, who, who's, the, who's, who's the greatest among us? Who's doing more? Who's doing what God wants them to do? Who's willing to sacrifice and give up all to allow God to be God? That's the people we need moving forward in the ministry. Not the people who say, look what all I bring. Look at everything that I bring to the table. All my studies, all my time, all my efforts. I've been here. I, 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 I laid that piece of carpet. 
I painted that corner. I put in that window. My family donated that whatever. And Jesus says, you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing the true power. You're missing the true focus. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Since my bar mitzvah. Since I knew that I was supposed to keep them. He never, he didn't speak to, to the fact that we're all born of a sinful nature. Amen? He didn't speak to that. Because that was a reality. He said since a boy. And what he was pointing back to was his bar mitzvah. When he finally came knowledgeable about the law. And since he had become knowledgeable about the law. He had kept those. Do you see how Jesus didn't, didn't record an exhaustive list of the commandments? He simply only pointed out the ones the boy thought he had kept. He didn't point them all out. So he was like, he was encouraged. Yeah, that's right. I've got all those. I was sure hoping he didn't mention that other one. Because that one I struggle with. I'm so glad he didn't bring that one up. But, but is that one, that, that one doesn't count? Great, I'm already there. Jesus, let's go look at my stuff. <laughs> so he's getting a little excitement. You know, then we see that, you know, that Peter had to convey this. He had to convey this emotion in words. He had to convey what he saw to, to Mark, because we know this is Peter's account. He had to convey what he saw in Jesus' face. In Jesus' action. In Jesus' body language. He had to try to communicate to that to us in a word. Because we weren't standing there, unfortunately. We couldn't see Jesus' face. Quite often, we, 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 we think Jesus' face is like this. Because <laughs> that's our face, right? <sighs> Again, how long do I have to be with y'all? When quite honestly, his face is... Listen, listen, listen. Stop waiting for your chance to speak. Stop waiting for, to, to discount what I'm trying to say because I have the eternal words of life flowing out of my mouth. Everything that I'm going to say to you has creative power because I am the Word of God. Listen. He who has ears, let him hear what I'm saying because those words are the gift of life. Not those words are eternal judgment. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Enough said we could go home. Even in the midst of all, in the midst of all that stuff, when that guy was still claiming the fame. When, when truly the good teacher was standing before him. The true good teacher, God, was standing before him and he attached himself with his accomplishments. These I've kept since birth. High five. And in the midst of that, Jesus looks at him and says, No, your problem, problem's more serious. Your problem's deeper but with love. The same way He looks at us. The same gift that He gave us to look at one another. But somehow we want to impart judgment and not love. And I don't understand it. God gave us love. And He gave us plenty to give. Let's just give that. And leave the other to who can rightfully do it. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. Because it's the only thing that counts. Amen? Amen. It's not that you had accomplished all these other things and you only need one more thing on your list. We got the checklist and we're almost ready to go. We need one more thing. And he's like, no, the one thing you lack is the only thing that you need. 
And that's a true understanding of who I am. The one thing that you lack, you've built your religion, you've built your success, you've built your life on all of these things that you could accomplish. The one thing that you lack is trust in me. And that's the only thing that matters. Because you can die with all the toys in the world. Matter of fact, surprise, you could even have a cross collection. You could. You could have Bibles this week on your shelf. And you could have read every single one of them in every translation. You could do all of that. You, you can go into the missionary field and actually see people come to know Jesus. You can do all of that. Without Jesus, headed on the same bus with Charles Manson to hell. Without Jesus. Because there is no good except for God. As you've heard me say before, this world will try to convince you that there is a plethora of choices. Eternity, loved ones, will make for sure that you understand that there's really only two. Eternity will guarantee that fact for you. My prayer is that you get that fact before you face eternity. There's not a plethora of choices. There is, I'm going to serve God because He's put it in me to serve Him. And I'm not going to talk about what I bring to the table because I'm going to serve Him with what He's given me to serve Him. Or I'm not. Which means I'm going to serve Satan. Because there is only two. No, 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 no. There's good. That's red letter. That's the same guy who said, let there be light and the light still shines. He said there's no good except God. Period. What I tell you? I've never put a period in the scripture where God didn't put a period. There's a period right there. Only good is from God. And guess what? He didn't give it to us to judge whether it was good or not. He gave it to us to judge whether it's God or not. Does that make sense? And that's for us. Rightfully dividing the word of truth so that you may know. For who? For them? No, for you. It's about your walk. It's about you knowing the truth. Not you being able to cast judgment about the truth. About you knowing the truth. And as you live the truth, just as Jesus lived the truth, that conviction comes through the Holy Spirit to those who don't know the truth. And then they can ask you about your pilgrimage. And you can say, man, I'll, come with me. Come with me. Not you better catch up. You're running behind. One thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Which is what you asked for. You ask, you ask what it is that I have that you do not. Treasure in heaven. My eternal life rock solid in heaven. That's what I have that you do not. And that's the one thing that you lack because you think <coughs> that you have something of value to bring to the table. So you miss the one thing. You lack the one thing. Now is that to say that we all live a vow of poverty? No. That's not what the scripture is saying there. It's, it, it is saying, it is alluding to the fact as we go a little deeper and we, we see where the disciples started to have this exchange and everything. It does say that, that once you've had wealth, once you've had the things of this world and, you, and you've accumulated them and everything else, that there's so much swarming around. And anybody who's ever had a lot knows what that's like. You know, the, the, most of the millionaires that are out there will tell you they'd rather bag groceries. Honestly. Honestly, because the, the responsibility and the pressure of all of that stuff swarms, swarms. But don't make the mistake. The love of money, the love of money, being broke, doesn't take you away from the love of money. Uh, amen? So it ain't, well, I'm broke, I don't have that problem. I wish I had that problem, there's the problem. <laughs> 
So being broke doesn't take us away from that truth. So it's not the money in and of itself. It's that we trust in that. And we think we've accomplished something. And other people look at us and say, wow, I wish I had that. Instead of looking at our lives. And the way he looked at Jesus and said, you know what, I've got all, all this stuff. But there's something that, that he's got, that he's given away, that I don't have. And I don't quite understand it. But, I, but, but I'm going to run out there and get it because I know I can get it. If I'm willing to put in the work, I can get it. And I can add it to my trophy case. And Jesus says, one thing you lack. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Great wealth that in his determination and on his scale, and in his judgment, was worth more than eternal life. Sad. He went away sad. We look at him and we go away with him sad. Jesus looked around. I think that's cool. It doesn't just say Jesus said. Jesus want to make sure they all had their heads up. You know, I had this with my son Quan. He came from a situation that was hard, and he did. He you know, a lot of times would have his head down and mumble when he when, you, when we do this. Heads up. Though. Are you listening? Can you? Okay. Now we got eye contact. That Jesus looked around. He didn't look around to make sure none of the Pharisees were there because he didn't want to drop his secret on them. <laughs> he looked around to make sure that they were all paying attention. He said, this is important. This is important for you to get. We'll want to make sure everybody, okay, raise your hand if you're listening. <laughs> How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Because what they say, we did broke. <laughs> Praise God, we did broke. We can enter just like that. <laughs> children, children, this is key. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Children. Children. The disciples were even more amazed. They hadn't heard that joke before. The camel, the eye of the needle. <laughs> Impossible. Funny. It's normally an elephant, Jesus, but we realize where we're at. Camels are around, so yeah, camel works. Uh, Jewish humor. You didn't get it? <laughs> That's the punchline. They had heard that, and they were even more amazed. And said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, <laughs> but not with God. Not with good. With good, all things are possible. All things are possible. Children. Children. Then Peter spoke up. Good old Peter. We have left everything to follow you. So we must be the best. Jesus loved him. I, I added that. I paraphrased it. Jesus loved him. <laughs> Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children <laughs> or field for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times much in this present age. Right now. That's key. Right now. 
homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions. Huh? That was a Tourette's thing from Jesus, right? He was talking about good stuff. Where do persecutions come? Because the reality of following, following Jesus, you know, I'll be quite honest with you. When he says, leave your homes and you have more homes and leave your brothers and your sisters. and You, you know what? I've got, I've got one biological brother. I've got thousands of spiritual brothers. Amen. Thousands. I don't even have a biological sister. I've got thousands of spiritual sisters. In this present age, today. The home that I have because of Jesus is far greater than the palace I could have had on my own. Because it's home. It's a place of solace. It's a place of rest. It's a place of reconnection. Not a place of surroundings. Far greater in this present age. Far greater. Hundredfold. Thousandfold. I love Jesus. But along with them, the persecutions that come. Because the reality is, is as you serve God, your intentions will be put at question. It's a reality. As you serve God and as you give your life to Him and as you move forward, your intentions will always, by a sinful and fallen world, be questioned. And that's okay. That's okay. Because I have a home to go to that Jesus gave me. I've got brothers and sisters a hundredfold bigger than my biological family. So I'm okay with the persecutions. Because everything else that I have because of Jesus far outweighs it. And I put it on the scale, just like the rich young ruler put it on the scale. And I've said there's nothing that I have of any worth. So let's just remove this altogether. Let's even remove that arm of the scale and just say, Jesus, I just want to step on yours. I just want to serve you. But he says, but many who are first will be last. And the last first. So don't try to flesh this out in your mind like you got it all figured out. You know, what you think is going to be first, who you think is the greatest among you, quite often is the person like he, we example with the foot washing in it, very, very often the person who we think is going to be the greatest is going to be the servant of all. The servant of all is our motivation to serve or to be served. Are we seeking opportunities to serve or are we waiting for opportunities to be served? How is it that we can come to this type of understanding about the rich young ruler? Because I've heard a lot of other messages. And like I said, I've even preached a lot of other messages about not really focusing in on him, more so focusing in on what Jesus was teaching. But here, focusing in on him and then what the message was to be for the disciples and the word that he used when he said children, when he addressed everyone around him as children, when he looked around and made sure everybody's eyes were up and he said, raise your hand if you're listening. And he said, children, where did that come from? It came earlier in the chapter. In Mark chapter 10, verse 13. It says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for Him to place His hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. Why? Why? Why would the people who are to support the body of Christ be rebuking the children? Because they were concerned for Jesus. They, they, they knew that he, he had a lot on his plate. He had a lot. Well, the crowds were pressing on him. When he walked somewhere, people charged him. He was just trying to get some rest. And we care. We care about Jesus. So the master's very, very busy. He's very, very busy now. Shalom. Now get your carrier and go. We can't, come, we can't bother Jesus with this right now. And it says Jesus became indignant. 
indignant. This word breaks down into grieve and much. Much grief. Indignant. <clears throat> I think it would be a great lesson for us to maybe find out what made Jesus indignant, what, what made Jesus grieve much. Because I do believe that what makes us indignant, what makes us hardcore when we think of the word indignant, is someone who is much grieved, but moving forward, amen? Not this, ooh, the or, right? Ooh. Not, that's not indignant. Indignant is I'm not accepting that. No, uh -uh. that grieves me. Because what grieves somebody tells you a lot about who they are. It tells, you, it tells you a lot more about who they are than what makes them happy, happy, happy. It tells them a lot more about you. What makes you indignant? Will you search yourself and ask yourself that question? What thing makes me indignant? Grieve much to the point of action. It doesn't say Jesus says, Oh, I can't believe they didn't bring your children. Y'all don't worry about me. Nobody else does. That's not indignant. That's cowardice. He said, no, bring them to me. What are you thinking? <coughs> That's why I'm here. That's the whole purpose. There is no other purpose. For the kingdom of God is to them. It's for them. Children. Children, look up. Look up. Raise your hand if you're listening. Children. The kingdom of God is for them. I'm his child. I'm listening. He rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And he said to them, Let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. Amen. Never. That's the power of the word of God. That's red letter Jesus saying, never. Not me. Him. So what does he mean by that? It's important, you think, to get what he means by that? Uh, the first thing that triggers is, oh, because children are so innocent. Anybody who's got a two-year-old knows that's a lie. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It can't be. It, 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 children aren't innocent. The only thing that keeps a, a child from being locked down in prison is the size of their body. <laughs> Amen? You, you give a two-year-old a six-foot-four frame, and you stay in the room with them. <laughs> Not this guy. Amen? It's not their innocence. It's not their innocence. What is it? What is it? What is Jesus saying to them? What is Jesus saying to them? Why? How does that message correlate? That's the same message that was put right before this rich young woman. And I can't think that it was coincidence. I can't think that it's coincidence that then he addressed and said, Children, children, listen, children. Remember, remember, remember what we just learned? Do you remember what we just learned, children? Why is it? Why is it that the rich young ruler wasn't able? Why? Because he didn't come as a child. He came to, there, there's no two-year-old. There's no one-year-old. There's no baby that's born into this world saying, look at everything I got. Wouldn't you like to have me? I got poop in my diaper. I belch up quite oftenly. And I cry every time I think I need something. Not you. I have all this stuff to offer. Uh-uh. The mo you've heard it said before, the most hopeless and helpless thing on the face of this earth is a human child. I mean, a baby wolf might make it. Might, might make it. Left unattended, might, because he can ch catch crickets and stuff. A baby, a baby human, zero chance of making it without attention. I hate to break the stories of the wolves raving a baby, but it didn't happen. In case you didn't hear that before, it didn't happen. 
A human baby is the most pitiful thing on the face of this earth. Desperate, desperately needing attention and care. What was Jesus saying? What was he saying? He was saying the thing that no matter where you were raised, you see, some off, so, sometimes often we think of wealth in different mindsets, especially over here in America. The reality is, is the poverty-stricken American is wealthy in another nation. Wealthy beyond comprehension in another nation. So our understanding of wealth is far, far <coughs> from a, a good understanding of wealth or having and, and, and not having. Amen? Amen. So it can't be that. It has to be something that no matter what color you are, no matter what culture you came from, no matter what, what part of the world or how much money you had or what family you were born into, no, no matter what, it has to be the one thing, the one thing that they all share, no matter where they come from, what color they are, or how much money their parents have. It's got to be the one thing that we all share. That is absolute helpless dependence. Every baby, every baby, no matter whether they're born to a crack house or born in a wealthy house, is helplessly dependent. And what Jesus says is, unless you come to me helplessly dependent on me, then you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Period. Amen. Children, are we listening? Amen. Are we listening? Why? Why could the rich young ruler not enter? Because he came with everything that he had. What can you use, Jesus? And Jesus says, it takes helpless dependence like these babies that are being brought to me, like these little children that are being brought to me, those are the ones who can come into the kingdom of God. And I'm here to tell you that it quite much, it feels, I don't know that I can truly remember what it, what it was like as an infant to, to be in my mother's arms. I don't know that I rationally and psychologically, cognitively can tell you that I remember laying in my mother's arms. But I know what it's like to be in my father's. Amen. Helplessly dependent on that caress. Helplessly dependent on everything that he has to offer. Amen. And realizing that I have absolutely nothing. Nothing to give him <coughs> except for my helpless dependence. And once I give him that, he can use me. Before that, before that, I'm just squawking about what I bring to the table. I'm just trying to impress others where I came from. Until I come to understand that with man, with man, you think you sought out God? You think you found Jesus? With man, that's impossible. If that's your testimony, I pray that today you get a real one. Because you didn't find God. God delivered himself, revealed himself to you. In your helpless dependence. Well, that's just your opinion, Clay. Well, it happens to be Jesus's also. So I got some backup. <laughs> and if you didn't get it the first time, Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Doesn't that make it pretty clear? It doesn't say we'll struggle to enter it. He says we'll never enter it. That's a definite word, isn't it? Is it never pretty definite? Especially coming from the voice that said, let there be light? 
If you haven't accepted Jesus that way, I pray that you'll be willing to do that today. Because he says, he sits there warm and fuzzy, arms open wide, ready to caress you as a little child and pat you on the back and say, everything's going to be fine. Everything moving forward is going to be fine. Anything that you've surrendered to get to this place will be given to you a hundredfold. Any family, any circumstance, any wealth, anything you think you've given up for me will be restored to you beyond your wildest belief. Just come and accept me with your helpless dependence so that I can restore you to the masterpiece that our Father desires to see. And if you do that, I'm going to go down this hallway and turn to the right, and there's your room in this mansion. Because I have prepared a place for you. For you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Because in this house are many rooms. If it weren't true, you wouldn't have said it. Loved ones, if this wasn't true, he wouldn't have said it. And he said, never. As we close out in song, <clears throat> I pray that we'll take the time to evaluate self. Because quite honestly, that's the one we've been given the gift to evaluate. Is to look at ourselves underneath the microscope of what Jesus just presented. And as he presented that truth, he said that unless as a little child, unless it's done in this helpless dependence, if you want to talk about everything that you've accomplished or how long you've been in church and what you've done in church and all, if you're trying to bring all of those things to the table instead of just saying, Wah. I don't even have language yet. Wah. I need you. If we're not willing to come to Him that way, then man, we're missing on all that He desires for us to have. My prayer is that you won't leave here an abandoned child. Because that's exactly what you are without Jesus. An orphan. When the dad is sitting there with open arms saying, just come. Just come. I see your sorrow. I see your pain. I see your questions. And I'm okay with all of that. I'm okay with your frustration and your anger and your animosity towards my people. Because they've done a miserable job. But please don't allow that to keep you from coming into my loving caress. Because unless you do just that, you will never enter the kingdom of God. That's judgment, Clay. That's truth. It's truth. It's truth from the person who spoke everything that we see into existence. It's truth. If you've accepted any other Jesus, if you've accepted any other religion, let today be the day that you accept your Father in heaven and let him wrap himself around you as a father does in love, in love. You know, us fathers, us fleshly fathers, we fail miserably too. Maybe yours did. Father in heaven absolutely will not, will not fail you, will not fail you. Nothing can pluck you out of his hand. Nothing Nothing can take his gaze from you. <coughs> Let's stand up and close out. And I pray, as we pray and sing this song, that you'll respond the way that God would have you respond. Because that's the most important. Not by any other motive or anything else, but, but just if God speaks into your heart that you would respond. Maybe, maybe that's a testimony. Maybe you want to give a testimony when we get through singing and praying. Maybe you want to come down front and pray. Maybe you want to come down and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I don't know. I don't know. My prayer is that you respond how God would have you respond. And that's it. So pray with me and then we'll 
sing a song. Father God, we are so thankful for the truth of your word. Oh, Father God, we are so thankful that there's not a checklist that we must accomplish before we can come to you. That is quite the opposite. We've got to get rid of the checklist. And say, God, I don't know what it takes other than just falling into your arms. But I know if I fall, I know if I fall, that you'll catch me. Father God, I pray that we don't allow tradition or history or any dynamic to keep us from that truth this morning. If we have any intention of being a difference in this community and abroad, we cannot give what we do not have. Help us to stand on that truth and help us to love people. Love people the way that you love them. Even through their sickness, love them. Because you've given us the power to do that. Not only the power, but the responsibility. Help us look at our hearts this morning, God. Change our hearts this morning. Come down front, just whatever it is you feel like.